Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. The Betty Gill Brown episode will be a two-part series. This episode discusses an unsolved murder involving some disturbing details and may not be suitable for all ages. Listener discretion is advised. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our podcast. I'm Miriam, and today we are chatting with Wayne Johnson. Wayne Johnson is a librarian with the Lexington Public Library. He's been working at LPL for 27 years. He grew up in Lexington and is our resident local history buff. The tragic murder of Betty Gail Brown in 1961. Thank you, Wayne, for joining us. Thanks um, for having me. Before we get started, I wanted to go over what our town was like. What was Lexington like in the early 1960s? Okay. Well, I grew up here in Lexington in the 60s. Mm-hmm. In the fall of 1961, Lexington still had the splendor and charm of a small town, college town. Mm-hmm. We had UK, Transy. Uh, this, the population of Lexington was around 63,000. Okay. And uh, Fayette County as a whole had a population of about 133,000. We were still more than a decade away from the uh, merger of city and county governments. Mm -hmm. Um, To show you how much we grew in the 60s, by the end of the 60s, population of Lexington was 108,000. And the county as a whole was 174,000 at the end of the decade of the 60s. This was about a 32% gain of population during a decade made Lexington one of the fastest growing communities in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it was a pivotal time during during the 1960s. Yes, for sure. Uh, Also in 1961, the transformation of Lexington from an economy based on retail, tobacco, horse farms, etc. had already just begun. The local industrial revolution could be said to have begun in 1956 when IBM Mm -hmm. came into uh, town and then Square D came in 1958 Mm -hmm. and other industries following shortly afterwards. Mm -hmm. But in 1961 compared to to today we were still a very small city college town you could say. Um, Like the rest of the country in the early 60s Lexington experienced the civil rights movement although not as on a grand scale as some of the Mm -hmm. other cities down south. Sit-downs had begun in the early 60s in restaurants and theaters in downtown Lexington. Mm -hmm. Uh, This was the Lexington I grew up in in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. Uh, Back in those days, the public library was actually located in Gratz Park Mm -hmm. across the street from uh, Transylvania's campus in Old Morrison. Uh, It was always a treat as a kid to visit the Carnegie Library and play in Gratz Park, including the James Lane Allen Fountain outside. I still remember going to the public library was uh, was a treat, but mm-hmm. actually driving by Old Morrison was even just as It's a grand great building, a tra- yeah. Always, great. for sure. Mm-hmm. So we were always fascinated about uh, Old Morrison and mm-hmm. seeing the building every time we visited. Very impressive building. Mm-hmm. And I do have a memory as a youngster when we were out playing in Gratz Park that sometimes we'd point across the street to Old Morrison, mm-hmm. and and I have vague memories of talking about well something bad happened over there, but I didn't. You know, I was four or five years old. I yeah. didn't quite know what, what happened, what but I, I just knew growing up, growing up that mm-hmm. something very terrible had happened mm-hmm. over there in front of Old Morrison. Mm-hmm. And the and of course that event was the murder of Betty Gail Brown. So Betty Gail Brown, what was her? early life like um, as a child? Well, Betty Gale was born on May 4, 1942 in Richmond, Kentucky Mm -hmm. to Hargis and Quincy Brown. Uh, She was their only child and she was a war baby. You know, May Mm -hmm. 1942, World War II had just begun. Our involvement in the war drew many Americans away from their families, including Betty Gale's father. In fact, Betty Gale did not see her father until after the war ended in 1945. When the Lexington Leader newspaper sponsored what what was called my Big Moment Essay Contest for children in early 1951, eight-year-old Betty Gale referred to the separation from her father with her essay mm-hmm. entry. Oh. And let me just read you what appeared in the newspaper. Mm-hmm. This is February 23rd, 1951. And the headline was, 
Betty Gail Brown's big moment was seeing her daddy home from war for the first time. The article goes on and says, a letter addressed to my big moment. Editor arrived today from Betty Gail Brown, age 8, 133 Iroquois Court. Mm -hmm. She wrote, my big moment was when my daddy came home from the war and I saw him for the first time. I was only three years and two months old when he came. I went right into his arms and was not afraid of him either. He had been gone overseas three and a half years, and I was sure it was he because I had seen so many pictures of him. Mm -hmm. I already loved him because he had sent me dolls from Iceland, Ireland, England, and France. So Betty Gale entered this contest, and there was hundreds of entries. Mm -hmm. And out of all the entries, uh, she won second prize with her essay and won a puppy as a prize. That's a nice prize. Oh, yeah, great prize. <laughs> Uh, a few months later, on Sunday morning, July 15th, 1951, uh, Betty Gale Brown made her first appearance on the front page of the newspaper with this headline, unfortunately, tragic moment for big moment prize winner. Nine-year-old Betty Gale Brown sent her wept bitterly yesterday afternoon when a hit-and-run motorist killed her six-month-old oh, puppy the prize she won in the Herald Leader My Big Moment contest. Uh, unfortunately, this would not be the last sad headline for Betty Gale. Yeah. Now, growing up in Lexington, Betty Gale was your typical youngster who was very active in church and school activities. Her mother got her involved with her church mm -hmm. early on. She began attending her church choir practice when she was one year old, oh. was pretty young. Yeah. And she continued to sing in the choir until her death in 1961. She began, began attending Sunday school at the age of two, and as she got older, she taught Sunday school at her church. Mm -hmm. She actually taught a class the Sunday before her death. Wow. Uh, as a student at Lafayette High School, she was a member of the National Honor Society and won a four-year scholarship to Transylvania. And in January 1960, in her senior year, she won a prestigious award as reported by the newspaper, oh. a Betty Gale appeared in the newspaper quite a bit. Back, like back in those days, the newspapers did more reporting on social events and kids' yeah. activities, yeah. Uh, much more so than they do today. So it was always a thrill for somebody to appear in the newspaper. Yeah. Well, anyway, when she won this award, uh, it was reported in the uh, newspaper, and it went as follows. DAR award goes to Betty Brown. Miss Betty Gail Brown, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Hargis T. Brown, has been selected by the faculty and student body of Lafayette Senior High School to receive the annual Good Citizens Award presented annually by the Bryan Station Chapter, Daughters of the American Revolution, to an outstanding senior girl. Mm -hmm. And there's a good definition of Bet uh, Betty Gale in, this, in the rest of this article, and let me read that. Miss Brown has been selected on the basis of dependability, service, leadership, and patriotism to her school. She is a member of the National Honor Society, Beta Club, French Club, Pep Club, Charmettes, Student Service Corps, College Club, Girls Choir, Representative for Lafayette and Christmas Caravan, and Secretary of Inner Club Council of White Teens. She is a member of Central Christian Church and is at present treasurer of the church youth group and a choir member. Wow. She's a very busy... Very busy and very accomplished student, it seems yes. like. Yes, oh, very, um, yes, yeah. very she focused. She liked to, I guess, her studies and, and was a very social person. Yes, and you could tell her parents, especially her mother, got her involved with these activities early on. And her activity continued on as she was a student at Transylvania? Yes, yes. Okay. Now, Betty Gale entered, entered Transylvania, uh, like I said, she, she got a four-year scholarship, which mm -hmm. is quite an achievement yeah, in itself. Mm -hmm. uh, she entered the, the school in the fall of 1960, and she Im immersed herself in the normal school activities like joining a sorority. Mm -hmm. She attended all the dances, very, very active in the social activities of the school, including the sorority. She was a member of the school choir mm -hmm. and also a member of the pep club. And like I said, she attended all the school dances. Uh, she was very personable and very popular in addition to being very studious and focused. Mm -hmm. and, and not what you would think that somebody would hate enough to kill. What was the activity like in her life in the week leading up to the crime? Well, in October 1961, which is when she was murdered, she had a very interesting and turbulent week. Mm -hmm. Just days before her murder, on October 18, 1961, Betty Gale Brown uh, again appeared on the front page of the newspaper. Okay. Uh, she was very photogenic. And <laughs> I guess the reporters just 
found her wherever <laughs> wherever she was because she she ended up in a newspaper quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Anyway, her picture showed up on the front page of the newspaper eight days before her murder, preparing for uh, upcoming Sadie Hawkins activities that weekend at Transylvania. Mm-hmm. Her picture was with a couple other students, and Betty Gale was clad in a kind of a little Abner Daisy May mm-hmm. outfit. That's the best way I can just describe <laughs> it. The photograph actually was taken only a few yards away from where she was found dead the following week. Coincidence, maybe, but after the murder, this photo would soon ramp up the list of possible motives and suspects. You know, uh, after she was murdered, it brings into the question, well, did somebody see this photograph and started, maybe started stalking her as a result? Maybe. Uh, pretty coincidental that the photo ended up in the newspaper only a week before she was found murdered. And as I mentioned, her, the week leading up to her murder was very turbulent for Betty Gale. Something was bothering her. Mm-hmm. Not sure what, but her classmates could probably, if they were still around, could tell you more. She reportedly fainted during a sorority meeting a few nights before mm-hmm. the crime. A classmate, after the crime had occurred, claimed that only a couple nights before the murder, she had had a dream about Betty Gale and something bad happened to her. She died in this dream yeah. of her classmates. Other classmates were very concerned about her well-being since she seemed to be under the weather. Uh, Her parents even claimed uh, she had been receiving threatening phone calls after her photograph had appeared on the front page of the newspaper the week before. So something was really troubling her Mm -hmm. for sure and directly or indirectly may have culminated in the the crime that took place. So talk to us a little bit about the the day of the crime. Well, Thursday, October 26, 1961, began as a normal day for Betty, Betty Gale. She had breakfast with, with her parents, and then it was off to campus for a day of classes and study. The Browns lived on the south side of town on Lackawanna Drive off Nicholsville Road, and Betty Gale Brown lived at home and commuted to school. Most of the transient students lived, lived in the dorms. On. Betty Gale lived at home. Uh, like most of her classmates, she was looking forward to the upcoming weekend of activities at school. Mm-hmm. It was Raffinesque weekend, and that meant a lot of activities, including a big dance. Uh, Halloween was just a few nights away, and excitement was all over campus in preparation for these uh, events. big events. Mm-hmm. But Betty Gale, being the studious uh, person that she was, had a very difficult biology test to prepare for the next day on Friday. She was disciplined and focused on this aspect of college life. I mean, she had her fun with mm-hmm. dances and so forth. But So anyway, after a day of classes, uh, Betty Gale returned to her home and had dinner with her parents. Uh, according to her parents, Betty Gale had suggested to them about a good movie that they may be interested in watching uh, in, in town. So around 7 p.m., the parents went out to see this in-town movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, Betty Gale Brown had told them that she would be returning to campus for an all-evening study session with three of her classmates for that all-important biology test the next morning. She had told them she would be home around 10.30 or 11 p.m. Mm. Uh, she left for campus shortly after her parents had left for the movie and arrived at Fourier Hall, which is a girl's dorm on North Broadway on Trancy's campus. Uh, she arrived there approximately 7 15, 7.30. After an evening of study with her classmates, uh, uh, Betty Gale bid her classmates and the dorm mom good night, and they watched her cross the street to her car parked directly across the street in a semicircular drive mm-hmm. right across from the dorm. And this was about 11.50 p.m. Since it was so late, her classmates asked her if she wanted to spend the night at the dorm since the test was at 8.30 the next morning. Uh, she declined, saying she wanted to wash and roll her hair before going to sleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, a fellow student who had just returned a date to the dorm saw Betty Gale in her car and pulled his auto next to her, and they chatted for a few minutes. Uh, after talking, according to this student, they both left the parking lot headed to their respective destinations. Uh, both cars headed out of the lot, taking a ride on North Broadway and a ride on 4th Street and then another ride on North Upper. And as a student pulled his car into the men's dorm parking lot, he saw Betty Gale's auto heading south towards 3rd Street. This was the last known person to see Betty Gale Brown alive. What happens when she doesn't show up at the house? Well, that's when we get to what I call the search. <laughs> um, she told her parents she'd be home by 10, 10 30, 11 o'clock. So when Betty Gale had not returned home by 12 30, 
her mother started to become worried. Mm -hmm. They had returned from the movie around 10 p.m. and the father with a headache went to bed while Quincy Brown, that's the mother's name, mm -hmm. waited up for her daughter. According to her account, when Betty Gale had not returned home by 1230, she began the first of three searches for her daughter. Without waking up her husband, she left the house and drove down Nicholsville Road, down Limestone, towards the Transit campus, using the same route Betty Gale normally used in hopes that she would see her as she was heading home. Yeah. Uh, she looked on side streets and drove past Old Morrison on 3rd Street, but did not go up the circular driveway. Mm -hmm. She drove up to the foyer hall dorm and without seeing anything, then drove back using the same route. She was expecting to see Betty Gale's car in the garage when she reached home and was alarmed when she did not see her car. So she immediately went out for another, another search, search. Uh, this time going down Rosemont to Clay's Mill, down Broadway and to the dorm again not seen anything and she returned home after the second search this is about 1 45 a.m she had decided to wake up her husband she did they called the hospitals and and police to see if any accidents had occurred involving her 1959 simple foreign made car mm -hmm. but they did not mention her by name uh, they didn't want to embarrass her if she had yeah. gone somewhere anyway uh, the father decided to go out for a short search of his own and he went to a couple of places, a restaurant and a uh, men's dorm over at UK mm -hmm. to see if she had gone over there. Then uh, finding nothing, he returned home and called the police to report his daughter was missing. And this was about 2.51 a.m. on the morning of October 27th. At this point, uh, and all units call went out to the police uh, to search for the missing Betty Gale Brown. About the same time, Quincy Brown went out on a third trip in search of her daughter using the same route she had used during the first search. She arrived on campus and parked in the parking lot across the street from the dorm. Um, now this was the very same spot Betty Gale had parked in earlier when she was mm -hmm. studying at the uh, four-year hall. When she arrived there, she saw the dorm house mother and some co-eds standing at the entrance door of the dorm and some of them were crying. Mm -hmm. So. At that point, I think she knew something was really wrong. So she walked over there and sensing something was wrong, she immediately crossed back over after talking to them briefly mm -hmm. and met a policeman driving through. Uh, she asked the officer if Betty Gale Brown had been located yet and the officer with grief written on his face said, we have found your daughter. Uh, after the dad called the police at 2.51 a.m. and the bulletin went out to, uh, to the police department, Shortly after 3 a.m., a police officer, Donald Duckworth, pulled up the semicircular driveway of Old Morrison and approached a frost-covered automobile parked just to the east of the illuminated lights of Old Morrison. And inside the car, with her head tilted back and sitting in the driver's seat with a bra draped over her shoulder and neck was Betty Gale. She had been strangled. Uh, when the officer had notified Mrs. Brown that her daughter had been found, she had said, don't tell me anything else, and he drove her home where she told her husband what had happened. She asked no questions of the officer on the trip home, uh, the how, why, where, who kind of thing that you normally would ask. She, she was probably in too much of a shock to ask questions. But anyway, Betty Gale was found. Mm -hmm. The search was over, but in a lot of ways, even today in 2018, she, she's... The search is still on it. Well, thank you, Wayne, for, for sharing your research with us. And it's, it's a fascinating story, and I think that's why people are still talking about it. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Join us next time as we discuss the murder of Betty Gale Brown. Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm. Or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at l-e-x-p-u-b-l-i-b dot org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane.